So good afternoon, everyone. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Sir Julian King, Commissioner for uh, Security Union. It's a personal pleasure because I remember with great fondness your time in Dublin uh, as ambassador uh, from 09 onwards. Uh, Sir Julian King is a distinguished diplomat in the British uh, Foreign Service, has also served in the Commission in a number of cabinets, uh, was Director General of the Northern Irish Office, and now uh, is Commissioner for Security Union. And given that uh, the theme of our day is uh, security, terrorism and governance, I can think of no one better to end the day uh, to talk to us about where this concept of security union has got to within the, uh, within the EU. So thank you very much for your presence and we look forward to your talk. No, thank you. Uh, this is an extraordinary form of torture to put yourselves through this all the way through the day and beyond six o'clock into the evening. Uh, but uh, I'm grateful at least uh, for the opportunity to uh, talk to you about some of these issues. Uh, what we've been up to over the last uh, nearly two years since uh, John claude Juncker asked me to take on this role, steering the work uh, across the Commission and working with other institutions to build an effective security union. Uh, it's also an opportunity, I think, to uh, pick up some of the comments that we've heard earlier on uh, and look a little bit uh, ahead to consider what remains to be done. Uh, uh, Edward uh, Statunius, who was a quite interesting man, he was the first US ambassador to the UN, uh, said, happiness has many roots, but none more important than security. Uh, now, in some ways, I have to be honest, uh, I'd be happy not to be doing this job, or at least happier if the circumstances uh, that led to my doing it hadn't occurred. But uh, there certainly is uh, a big job to do. It's a very important job. Uh, reflecting what you've been talking about for the last uh, couple of days. Uh, in poll after poll, citizens across Europe uh, rate security one of their top concerns, as we all know. And they look to uh, their authorities to do something about it. Uh, I like to think that the Commission, uh, along with the other uh, institutions in Brussels, has, has played uh, a positive role in driving forward cooperation to address these security concerns, and that we've made some uh, important progress, uh, in part because I think we've made a series of, of sensible, practical proposals, but I'm realistic enough to recognize in a large part because the nature of the threat, the threat picture, has driven the need to work together. It's driven that uh, greater cooperation. Uh, now, I'm not quite sure what the percentages are, we can debate those, uh, but member states and member states' authorities are clearly in the front line when it comes to tackling terrorism and cyber and cyber-enabled threats and serious organized crime. Uh, our focus today is on terrorism, so that's what I will talk about. But the cross-border, interlinked, often indiscriminate nature of these threats means we're more effective in countering them when we work together. And there is, uh, and it's been reinforced as we've heard, uh, a strong recognition across Europe uh, that there are many things that we can and indeed should do collectively at the European level uh, to help and support the member states uh, to tackle these threats. And I think rather than thinking of it in terms of percentages, it's, it's, it's whether there's a positive feedback uh, and a a feedback that builds the trust, which is absolutely at the core of effective cooperation. Um, we in the Commission uh, have sought to mobilize the full range of instruments that we have at our disposal. Uh, so that includes, where necessary and proportionate, uh, we've not shied away from, and we won't in future shy away from, uh, proposing legislation and regulation. Uh, we've uh, further developed and reinforced EU-level law enforcement and security agencies. Uh, we've just heard from Europol, uh, Eurojust, CEPOL, who do training, uh, other agencies where we've boosted the links and cooperation on security, including Frontex, 
some new agencies, less well known, EU LISA that helps build these databases that we'll be talking about. Uh, but also, as part of the wider security family, uh, agencies like the Fundamental Rights Agency uh, and the European uh, Data Protection Supervisor have a key role in making sure that we get policy in this area uh, right. Uh, we're modernizing and reinforcing what I would call the ecosystem of EU law enforcement databases. We've been talking about the Schengen Information System, uh, but there are a number of others that we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Uh, and we're building a series of networks of policymakers and practitioners, uh, which we support, including through funding, uh, to help identify and drive policy development and to exchange best practice on delivering that policy on the ground. On subjects as diverse as tackling radicalization, better protecting public spaces, and boosting rail security, just to pick a few. Our approach in all of this has been to develop two strands of action. First, uh, to deny those who wish to do us harm the means with which uh, to harm us by closing down the space that they have to move so movement, money, munitions, and manpower. And secondly, at the same time, also to build resilience, both against attacks, making ourselves harder to attack, and in terms of being able to respond when the worst does happen. So taking those in turn, uh, we have, I believe, made progress uh, in, in tackling movement for example. Uh, two years ago, uh, we were in the midst of a migration crisis that threw a spotlight both on the porosity of our external borders and on the shortcomings of our information systems. Uh, terrorist attacks showed, unfortunately, the relative ease with which returning terrorist fighters were able to re-enter our shared space and move around to prepare their attacks uh, uh, across different countries. And we've learned a lot of lessons since then, and we've been able to put into practice uh, measures to make this much harder. Uh, the starting point was to table the counterterrorism directive that's been referred to, criminalizing training uh, and travel for terrorist purposes, uh, setting EU-wide definitions and penalties. And those EU-wide definitions are gonna be important in a number of respects. We've strengthened controls at the external borders uh, including entry-exit checks, as we've heard, for all passport holders, and uh, the transformation, really, of Frontex, uh, complete transformation of that organization into what is going to be a really effective European border and coast guards. Uh, we've also cracked down on the fraudulent use of fake identities. As we've heard, too often we've seen uh, attackers use multiple fraudulent identities to evade detection until it's too late. And we've replied, we've responded to that in, in at least two ways. Uh, firstly, by looking at the security of identity documents. So we've got improvements to the security features of uh, EU citizens' identity documents, uh, including where they have them, ID cards and residence documents. Uh, and secondly, to radically alter the way our EU-wide information systems work so that we can use data as an effective tool in this fight. We have seen through analyzing how some of the attacks took place uh, that there were gaps in our information systems and failings in the way those information systems work. And we've responded first by making sure that we were maximizing the, the benefits of the existing information systems, uh, building this virtuous circle that we've been talking about of sharing the information, member states feeding these databases, because they can use the information, because they see that it is actually useful and effective to share. Uh, and the Schengen information system is the central pillar of this work. Uh, the amount of information shared across the Schengen information system went up, uh, and the amount of times it was being used, uh, went up 40% in 2016, and went up a further 30% on top of that in 2017. So again, 
we've been cautioned about statistics, uh, but there is clear evidence of greater engagement uh, by all the member state agencies uh, with these European-wide databases. Uh, where we knew there were functionalities missing, uh, we've tried to address that. Uh, so we have found ways of putting more biometric information into these different databases. Uh, there's something called um, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System that we have built in to uh, the Schengen Information System so that people can uh, collect and share key biometric information. There were some gaps. There were clear gaps. There were things we weren't doing. Uh, and we have tried to, working with the member states, fill some of those gaps. So we will now have an entry-exit system to record movements into our shared space uh, by third country nationals. Uh, and we will have a pre-clearance system modeled on the American ESTA system that I no doubt you're familiar with uh, for uh, visa exempt third country nationals. Not because we're trying to keep anybody out with these systems, but so that we can have a richer texture of information about people who are coming in and out of our shared space. And thirdly, and uh, this is still work in, in progress, uh, we are determined to make sure that these different systems are able to work together better. In particular, uh, we come forward with a set of proposals which go under the very catchy title of interoperability, uh, which are designed to deal with uh, identity fraud and people circulating within our shared space and are not being able to identify them. Uh, these are not new systems. The systems are the systems that, that I've already described, but they are essentially new ways of using our systems, including new search facilities. Uh, it's not complete rocket science, uh, but we have to be able to do it in a way uh, that is completely sound and respects the uh, data protection uh, and privacy concerns that rightly we are uh, held to account over. So, uh, by not changing the rules around who has access and who can use the information, uh, we nevertheless believe that we can make sure that those on the front line, uh, the border guards, the immigration officers, the police officers who keep us safe, can get the information that they need in a timely fashion, and that in a few years' time, when these systems are fully in place, it won't be possible for uh, a third country national who's arrived uh, legally and legitimately in our shared space uh, to be circulating without a bona fide identity. Um, we've also got to make full uh, use of these systems and that means getting the member states to implement them. So there's a number of things that have been agreed that aren't yet in force. Uh, the Example that is often cited is the passenger name record system, the system for recording uh, people arriving in our airports. Uh, after a long and tortuous discuss discussion lasting some years, it was agreed we were going to do this. It was agreed that uh, all across the EU, the member states would build this system, uh, and they were given a certain amount of time to do that, which uh, elapsed uh, uh, earlier this year. Um, Fourteen of the member states have done it. Uh, five other member states have got effective systems in place. That still leaves, do the maths, uh, a number of member states who are not yet in a position to do this. So there is, a, there is a constant job of working with the member states to deliver things that we have all collectively agreed uh, should, should happen. Uh, the second area that we've been working on, and we've been debating it here this afternoon, uh, is, is money. Uh, is funding. Uh, I agree uh, with those who said earlier on this afternoon uh, that given the, the shift in the nature of, of the threat picture and some of the recent attacks, um, tackling the financing, following the money, isn't necessarily about denying capability, although it can be in some cases. But it is absolutely crucial to building up your intelligence picture. Uh, because financial dealings, financial relations can and often do leave traces. And those are traces, even if it's five pounds or five euros, 
rather than some huge sum of money. Those are traces that you can uh, use to build your uh, intelligence picture. So we have done a series of measures. Uh, the latest is the, as we've heard, the fifth anti-money anti -money laundering directive that have increasingly given us um, the connections that are needed to build that kind of picture. They've also, as it happens, made it easier uh, and quicker to freeze and confiscate uh, illicit resources, which has some bearing on terrorism, but is particularly useful in fighting serious and organized crime. Uh, we've worked to expand that cooperation internationally beyond uh, the EU member states. And we're going to continue to build it. But there are further steps. We proposed uh, uh, in April uh, a series of steps that we want to take to facilitate law enforcement access to financial information, uh, including in uh, central bank uh, account registries, which all member states now need to have, and to strengthen the links between the financial intelligence units that each member state uh, has as well. Uh, the US have a system, which we've heard about this afternoon, uh, of the terrorist finance tracking program. It is an incredibly effective system. Uh, and through uh, Europol's relationship with it, we here also benefit from that financial intelligence system that the US have. I don't see why we can't, providing we can do it in a way that respects um, uh, privacy and data protection, work towards some system like that uh, for, for Europe and for Europeans during, uh, during the years ahead. Third thing, munitions, uh, arms and explosives. Uh, we've seen, unfortunately, uh, both arms and explosives used to horrible effect in a series of attacks across our countries. Uh, and we believe that we can and should do more to uh, stop easy access to these munitions. So we've strengthened the rules on access to explosive precursors, the materials that are used to mix to make uh, homemade explosives, TATP, that we've heard about. Um, ordinary members of the public, uh, people who don't have a professional reason for getting access to these materials, uh, now will uh, have to go through certain steps if they want to purchase uh, these materials. They'll have to get licenses and they'll have to be cleared to get those licenses. Uh, we have um, strengthened significantly controls for online sales, which unfortunately was a bit of a blind spot. Uh, and we've tightened the controls all the way up the supply chain. Likewise with firearms, um, both within uh, the European Union and for trade in and out of the European Union. Uh, it was slightly controversial in some of our member states, but we did get agreement uh, to, uh, through something called the Firearms Directive, to take military-grade semi-automatic weapons out of private hands across Europe. Uh, some who, who hunt and some uh, who do uh, sports shooting felt um, that this was overreaction, uh, but I'm not absolutely sure that you need Kalashnikovs to go hunting. Uh, so uh, I stand by the measures that we've taken to tighten the controls around those kind of weapons. Uh, and internationally, uh, we have taken steps to crack down on, on trafficking, uh, particularly through strengthening our cooperation with the Western Balkans, and uh, to tighten the controls around import and export of firearms for civilian use. So that um, you need now, if you're going to be doing that, uh, to go through various checks, including checks against the European uh, criminal records system. Unfortunately, even if you take away the funding, the ability to travel, uh, and the weapons, individual terrorists can still cause tremendous damage, uh, as we've seen. Uh, using, using very simple tools. Uh, and the recent pattern of, of low-tech attacks has, has brought us up against um, some limits in terms of what we can do about the means that are being used. So we also have to look at manpower. 
why are people falling for this franchise and joining these franchises and going down the route of violence? Uh, so uh, the work that we've been doing, which we've been talking about a little bit today, uh, on prevention, uh, on tackling uh, radicalization and recruitment is absolutely essential and is at the very heart of this range uh, uh, of activities. Uh, we need to find ways of helping vulnerable people from falling prey to these radicalizing influences. Now, we've had an extensive debate about why this is complicated uh, uh, and difficult, uh, and I accept all of that, uh, but I also believe that we need to keep trying. Uh, and that means uh, that we need to work with uh, the grassroots, those on the front line in our communities who are trying to deal uh, with uh, radicalization in our communities. Uh, we've had some time something called the Radicalization Awareness Network, which I'm sure many of you have, have um, heard about or had something to do with. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that when it comes to dealing with what one of, one of you called the face-to-face, the, -face, the risk of face-to-face -face encounters uh, leading to radicalization. Uh, we it's not something that we can design a, a policy in Brussels uh, to roll out across the European Union. Uh, that won't work. Uh, we have to recognize that those on the front line uh, at the grassroots, often civil society actors, are best placed to understand the challenges and we have to listen to them. Uh, but we can help and support them. So we have this network that brings people together from all across Europe uh, to exchange best practice, learn from each other, see what works, see what doesn't work so well, uh, and also to support each other, uh, because this can be quite lonely, difficult, long-term work. Uh, one of the things that we heard from all sides uh, was that uh, there was sometimes a gap between civil society uh, and public authorities, policymakers, on these issues. Uh, and so we're now trying to see whether we can do something to help bridge that gap. Uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, we've been running something called the High Level Expert Group on Radicalization for some time, listening to all sides. And one of their key recommendations is that we should try and expand the network to bring in uh, public authorities who tackle radicalization issues as well. So not only at the national level, but also at the regional level and at the local level, the level of cities who are often um, the public authorities who are grappling with these challenges. Uh, and we're going to find a way of, of doing that without um, losing the benefits that we've, I'm absolutely convinced we've gained from the bottom up grassroots civil society um, actors telling us what works. Uh, and uh, we've also got to focus on some particular areas. Um, we've heard about radicalization in, in prisons. We've heard about the challenge of uh, returnees and indeed uh, the challenge of people uh, being released uh, after serving their sentences. Uh, but the particular challenge that I think we have to always bear in mind uh, is young people. Uh, and vulnerable young people, which is why I think there is a real need to also look at the internet. Uh, I agree with those who were debating earlier saying that the internet isn't the cause of radicalization in many cases, uh, but it is an incredibly strong vector uh, of radicalizing material, and given the role that it plays in uh, the lives of young people, it can, in some cases, be the key way in which they interact and come into contact with radicalizing material. So we are going to continue, and indeed we're going to redouble our efforts to try and get uh, radicalizing material, terrorist material, off the internet. Uh, we've heard about the progress that we've made, good progress that we've made on a voluntary basis uh, through public-private partnerships, um, in particular the EU Internet Forum, which has worked very, very well, uh, and Europol's work, um, both their work and the example they've set for member states to, to work between law enforcement authorities and uh, the platforms. Uh, but uh, there's still far too much of this stuff out there. Uh, so at the beginning of March, we set out a series of concrete um, objectives 
that we wanted to see the platforms make progress on between then and this summer, uh, to take down material within one hour when it was notified by law enforcement, to make greater use of automated means, uh, both to spot material and to stop material that had been taken down from being re-uploaded, uh, to uh, work together, so the big platforms to support the smaller and medium-sized platforms who don't have the same resources to devote to this, uh, and all platforms uh, to work more with law enforcement. And uh, we are going to check uh, progress against those objectives in the coming weeks, and if necessary, uh, we will come forward uh, uh, later this year with proposals for uh, legislation in this area. And that is controversial, um, but it is, I think, uh, imperative that we focus on this illegal terrorist content. And there are clear definitions. Uh, the, uh, the directives uh, that we've already passed mean that as well as national definitions of terrorism, terrorist content, there are EU-wide definitions of terrorist content. So we know what we are focusing on here. The second pillar of action, as I mentioned, uh, is to try and build our, our resilience to attacks and our ability to recover. Uh, again, learning the lessons of the recent uh, attacks. Uh, we have seen uh, a pattern of attacks targeting uh, public spaces, places where people are going about their their everyday business, living their normal lives. Uh, and we want to do something to help uh, make such attacks harder. Uh, again, you can't design a policy in Brussels that is going to work in public spaces uh, all across uh, the European Union. So uh, instead, uh, we have brought together a, a network of uh, practitioners, people who work on these problems, particularly city and local authorities, with the private sector, uh, because many of the spaces that we're talking about are, are co-owned, um, public, private, uh, to work through the different problems and challenges. And we've also mobilized quite a considerable amount of funding uh, uh, this year and next year to encourage cities to work together uh, and learn from each other and bid together uh, for some 120 million euros worth of funding uh, to pursue projects in, in this space. Uh, we've broken it down into particular challenges. So we are now trying to work through with uh, people who, who have a role in vehicle hire, for example, whether there are things that we can sensibly, proportionately do to deal with the risks of vehicles being hired and are misused. Uh, we're also looking at uh, different, um, uh, different areas that have been attacked. So a series of attacks have been mounted on, on our railway network, on our stations and in our trains. And we're working there to try and reinforce uh, rail security, working again with public authorities and private sectors. Uh, but resilience isn't just about um, concrete blocks or transport infrastructure. Uh, it's also about adjusting to new threats. So uh, we unfortunately need now to take more seriously uh, the threat from chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear uh, substances. Uh, we launched some time ago some work on this, but uh, events like the attack in, in Salisbury where a chemical uh, weapon was used on, on our streets in Europe uh, underline that trying to think about these challenges is anything but academic. Uh, again, working with uh, public authorities across the European Union, uh, we are systematically identifying substances that are risk substances, working through what you might do to uh, strengthen the controls on access to those substances if need be, and uh, exercising, preparing uh, to deal with what would be a, a horrible attack uh, were it to take place. So a lot done uh, in different areas, uh, but we need to keep going. Uh, the threat picture itself 
constantly evolves and changes, and we have to be able to evolve and change our response accordingly. Uh, fortunately, Europol have an enormous amount of expertise, draw on an enormous amount of expertise, and regularly review the evolving nature of the threat. Uh, and just the other week, uh, they came up with their latest report on uh, trends uh, and challenges. Uh, firstly, clearly from their analysis, uh, terrorists will continue to target people and symbols of authority and our, and our lifestyles. So what do we do about that? Well, in response, we're going to have to, I think, redouble our efforts to deny them uh, the means and the opportunity. And we're going to have to implement uh, the things that I've just been talking about. Uh, PNR directive, strengthened external borders, better information sharing based on interoperable systems, all things that we know we need to do, and now we need to press ahead uh, and do them. Secondly, attacks are increasingly likely to be carried out by lone actors, as we've been discussing, uh, with limited resources rather than any kind of well-funded, highly trained groups. So that means that we need to work even more closely with those on the front line, uh, in communities, in cities, uh, to prevent our vulnerable, especially young people, from becoming radicalized in, in the first place. And it also means, as uh, Gilles was uh, highlighting, that we have to find ways of marrying together uh, intelligence and law enforcement work. Uh, that is happening at a national level, uh, but we also need to look at the collective level, the European level, at what more we can do in this field. Thirdly, uh, the internet is going to remain an absolutely crucial vector for terrorist recruitment, incitement, education. Uh, so we need to redouble our efforts with the platforms, as I say, on a cooperative and voluntary basis, but if necessary, through legislation and regulation. Fourthly, uh, Daesh and the other groups may have lost territory, uh, but their organizational structures uh, are still there. Uh, some of the old groups are coming back. Uh, so we have to be conscious that there's no, there's no taking our eye off the ball. Uh, there's no peace dividend in our counterterrorism work. We can't expect that somehow next year or the year after, we're going to be able to save some money and some resource in this field. We have to make a long-term commitment, as a number of the speakers have underlined. Uh, in practical terms, from the Commission's side, that means we have to commit the resources to help and support the member states. Uh, I'm glad that as we've proposed budgets for the next budget period from uh, 2021 forward, uh, we have more than doubled uh, the amount of money uh, that is targeted on um, internal security work, uh, law enforcement, uh, and um, associated agencies, uh, up to 2.5 billion. Uh, we've increased the amount of money that we're proposing for our EU agencies to over a billion. Uh, plus, we are identifying funding for cyber and cybersecurity, for research into security issues. We are making security one of the themes for uh, regional funding. And as Gilles noted, uh, it is a major theme for our external funding as well. There's a lot we need to keep doing. Much of it is going to be unglamorous and quite a hard slog. Uh, Jonathan, I think, was responsible a few years ago for uh, an advert for recruiting people to um, MI5, which said, see all your best work go unnoticed. <laughs> uh, and that largely is the case. Uh, but we also need to find ways of talking about what we are doing. To help set uh, uh, the terms of a wider political debate. Because if we don't get this right, we can have the wrong kind of political discussion. Uh, the wrong kind of discussion that mixes migration and security in an unhelpful and a, uh, a way that really just serves 
the interests of Daesh and others who are trying to divide our, our communities. Uh, the wrong kind of discussion uh, around uh, identity uh, and, and solidarity and respect in our communities. Very difficult discussion around uh, religion and uh, its role in our modern, largely secular societies. So as well as doing things, as well as getting on with this agenda uh, of practical steps, which uh, I think is very, very important, uh, we also need to find the right way of framing this work and, and talking about it. We can't eliminate all risk. Uh, it's a, not a realistic ambition. It's misleading to pretend that we can. But working together, we can reduce the risk and we can make progress towards uh, a more secure Europe for, for all our citizens. Practically, our work to build a security union reflects our responsibility, the responsibility we have towards our citizens to help keep them safe. Politically, how we deal with security uh, and migration, uh, cyber, cyber-enabled threats, as well as terrorism, will shape our societies for the future perhaps as much as our stewardship of the economy. So this is absolutely crucial work, and it's crucial that we get it right. Thank you very much for the interest that you're taking in it.